Hi everyone, my name is Karen. This is my channel, Rather Be Reading, and today I'm bringing to you a recent reads video. So it has been a week since I last filmed a recent reads video, but we are still playing catch up. This uh, recent reads video is going to be everything that I read from the 12th of June through the 2nd of July. Um, and I read 20 books during that three week period. So we've got a lot to talk about. I also want to apologize up front if this lighting is really shit. I apologize. It's way later in the day than I normally film and it's winter here. So um, it's late in the afternoon and we're rapidly losing light. So I need to get through all the videos I need to film today ASAP. So let's jump straight in and talk about all of the books that I read in this three week period. So the very first book that I completed was The Slaughterman's Daughter by Yaniv Ixkovix. This is translated from the Hebrew by Or Sharf. And this is a book that I was approved to read from Neck Alley. Um, and this is very hard to describe. It is a historical fiction set in the um, Pale Settlement, so which is an area of Russia, I think it is, um, where uh, Jewish people were basically like sent, not necessarily sent, but like they were well, maybe sent. There were areas of um, where Jewish people lived like all together. Um, and we're following basically a woman whose sister's husband went missing. But he's not like missing. There's this like whole thing of like where sometimes women's husbands will just like leave them and like go off and like go to one of the big cities and like leave the wives and their children to like fend for themselves um and it's very hard for the women to make a living and like survive without their husbands um and it's we're following the sister of a woman whose husband did this and she's basically decided that she is going to go and track down her sister's husband and bring his sorry ass back to take care of his family the synopsis of this, in my opinion, is very misleading. It leads you to believe that there's some kind of mystery. So what I just told you is the actual synopsis. And that's not like, um, like, you know that pretty much up front. Whereas when you read the synopsis, it leads you to believe that there's this whole mystery to why the main character left, what she's doing, what, like, was she involved in, like, someone, dead bodies that were found near town? Was it related to her brother-in-law going missing? We know all of that, like, up front. There's no mystery about it. Um... I found the story incredibly slow. Nothing happened for most of the book. Um, having said that, this has very positive reviews. It seems like most other people who read this really, really, really enjoyed it. I just found it really, really, really boring, quite frankly. Um, and I ended up giving it 2.5 stars. I was frankly disappointed in it. Um, I then read my TBR teacup pick from May, which was Three Women by Lisa Tadeo. This is a nonfiction book. Um, where Lisa Tadeo basically followed three separate women. Um, and this is a look into their sex lives. I, I don't want to say about this. I wish this was a little more diverse. This does follow three white women. Having said that, though, I understand that it was very hard for Lisa Tadeo to find subjects to write about in this because she followed these women for, I can't remember how long it is, but it's a lengthy, like, years and years and years. And she does talk about at one point, either at the end or at the beginning, that she did follow other people at certain points who all, like, different people all, like, pulled out through the course of the time that she was um, studying them, like, didn't want to be written about. So, and I believe that at least one of those people was a woman of colour. So I can understand how... It was hard for her to get like subjects who were willing to be written about. Um, it's written in a very narrative style. So it's very easy to read. Um, it's written as like kind of as if it were fiction. And the, so the three women, we're following a woman, three women, one of which is was in a sexual relationship with a teacher of hers when she was um, in high school. Um, and there is like court proceedings surrounding that. We're following her. We're following a woman who is struggling in a sexless marriage. And then we're following another woman who um, her and her husband enjoy having her, her having sex with other people, um, sometimes in front of him or filming it and showing the videos to him. So like there's some things there. Um, I struggled with what kind of the message of this was. It felt like it was supposed to be 
about empowering women and like the power of female sexuality, but that's not to me the way any of these stories came off. I don't know. I just really struggled with like, I don't know. I just really struggled with this. I gave it three stars. Like it was okay. And I was interested, but I just not sure what I was supposed to get out of this in the end, if that makes sense at all. So I gave that three stars. I then read The One Who Got Away by Carolyn, Caroline Overington. Um, this is a thriller. It basically follows a, a woman whose stepsister um, is was like leading a very privileged life, was married to like a rich man, had um, two like twin daughters living a very like privileged existence. Her and the husband go on kind of a second honeymoon on this like cruise um, and the her sister goes missing. Um, and they don't know whether she, they obviously presume she's gone overboard, but they don't know whether she jumped, uh, was pushed, did the husband murder her, lots of that going on. Um, and we get, we get a couple of different perspectives. So we get the stepsister who is, has been left behind trying to figure out what's going on. But then we also get uh, diary entries from the sister who's gone missing of her life, like from basically when she met her husband leading up to like the cruise and what happened from that side of things. Um, I also, I was disappointed a little bit because Caroline Overington is an Australian author, though. I do understand that she lives in the US now. Um, I think she is. I know she's Australian. Anyway, and this, I was disappointed because I was expecting this to be set in Australia and it's not. It is set in the United States. Um, and this story like, I know that I've watched, like, an episode of 48 Hours that's, like, basically follows, like, this exact type of mystery where a couple has gone away on a cruise, one person of the couple doesn't come back, and then it's, like, what happened? Um, and it's a very, like, interesting area of, because there's, like, a lot of inter um, implications of, like, international law, like, what waters were they in? Um, who has jurisdiction over this crime if there was a crime? Um, all of that. Um, so, I don't know. This was just okay. Um... The ending to me, it was really, really anticlimactic. Um, there was like part that was in there that didn't feel like it fit in with the rest of the story and that it just felt like it was in there kind of for like a twisty, like shock value, which I didn't love. Um, this was just okay. I ended up giving it three stars. Ooh, I then um, read um, another one of my books that I was provided in exchange for an honest review through NetGalley, which was Dark Lullaby by Polly Ho Yen. I will reiterate again that all of the NetGalley arcs that I'm talking about um, are um, NetGalley books that have already been out and published. If you're interested in them, they are available for you to pick up. So this is set in a dystopic future where basically um, women cannot get pregnant on their own. Um, like infertility is like a real issue. And in order to for women to have children, they have to go through this really, really like invasive medical procedures that is really, really terrible on them and their bodies. And a lot of women die and it's like a really big deal. Um, and then when they do finally manage to have a child, they are, if they manage to have a child, they are very, very, very strictly monitored by the government. Um, you can be given warnings about any kind of bad quote unquote parenting. And if you rack up so many um, warnings or whatever, so many yeah, I guess warnings, you can have your child extracted, which basically, basically means they take your child away from you. And we're following a character who had never planned to have children, um, but then she's in a relationship and her and her partner decide that they do want to have a child and then they have a child and it's basically following that story. I thought the world was quite interesting. The implications of like if infertility became such an issue and so children became such kind of a precious commodity would the government get as heavily involved as what they do in this book who can say um it kept me really really engaged and I personally I think the ending will be divisive but I personally loved the ending and I ended up giving it 3.75 stars I then read a, another NetGalley arc and that was Chopping Spree by Angela Sylvain this I was really excited about if you recall it is a it's, it's very short book like almost a novella, but it's a little bit longer than a novella. Well, maybe it would be described as a novella. I think it's just over 100 pages. It's about a girl who is working in an 80s inspired mall um, when basically they're after hours at some kind of party and there is uh, someone murdering people. That was the premise that I thought going in. I thought even if this is bad, it's going to be good. I was wrong. It was just bad because it wasn't as slashery 
as what I hoped. It goes kind of down a different path that I don't want to say because it would kind of be spoiling things. So I was left a little bit disappointed by that. Um, some of the stuff that was going on just didn't really make sense to me. Um, I get the kind of message that it was trying to send kind of about consumerism. Um, but I overall was just kind of disappointed in the end and I gave it 2.5 stars. I then listened on audio to The Invisible Life of Addie LaRue by V.E. Schwab. This is narrated on all audio by Julia Whalen. I'm sure you guys have all heard about this book because it's been incredibly popular. It is about a um, girl named Addie LaRue who, I can't remember, it's a long time ago, in the 1700s or 1600s. She is living in France um, and she basically ends up making a deal with a, um, it's not the devil, but it's like a dark, a dark god of some kind um, that... And she makes a deal with him and the repercussions of that deal is that no one will ever remember her. So as soon as she basically leaves the eyesight of someone, they forget all about her. She's completely erased from their memories. But she is immortal. So she has now lived, it's now like present day, she's been living for hundreds of years. Because basically if she decides uh, to give up, um, then uh, the dark god, whoever it is, gets her soul. Um and so she's still holding on, refusing to give in, still living, but with no one ever, ever, ever remembering her until one day somebody does. I really enjoyed this. I, I mean, just the fact that the main character is still alive because she refuses. Oh, hi, Winifred. She, hi, she refuses to give in to this like devil um, character to like let him take her soul. She's just like, no, I refuse. I absolutely refuse to let you win. And even though this is maybe not the existence that I want and it's going on for hundreds and hundreds of years. Um, fuck you. I'm going to keep going with it. And I love that. Um, the writing I really, really enjoyed. Like this book has been incredibly popular. And so I wasn't sure how I was going to feel about it, but I loved it just as much um, as everybody else does. Again, I feel like the ending of this one could be divisive, but mm, A plus for me. Loved the ending. Um, and so I ended up giving this 4.5 stars. I really, really, really enjoyed it. I then read Ruined by Amy Tintera. This is a the first book in a trilogy. It is YA, although I would say this kind of borders on like new adult about a girl who it's like it's a fantasy setting. She lives in one kingdom that has kind of been overthrown, I guess, by like a neighboring kingdom and her family basically her both her parents have been murdered throughout the course of like, you know, all of this happening and her sister was kidnapped and is being held captive. Um, and her people are very, there's not very many of them left. They've basically been hunted down and killed because her people have magic. Um, and so she decides that she is going to pose as the, so like the head of like the, the king of the kingdom that's like repressing her people. She is going to pose as his son's new bride um, so that she can murder the prince and like start kind of a revolution and hopefully get her sister back who's being like imprisoned, held captive. So a pr premise that we've heard before, but it is a premise that I enjoy. Um, I had mixed, <coughs> excuse me, I had mixed feelings on this. So I will say that this went there. Like this isn't like all talk, no action. Um, this isn't really a spoiler because this happens straight up. So I'm just going to tell you it happens right at the very beginning. She straight up murders this girl who she is like going to be um, impersonating. So in order to like impersonate, this, this girl has done things like this girl, I think has murdered her father or murdered someone like it's from like there's a bunch of neighboring kingdoms she was from a kingdom that came in murdered her father like or caused her father to be murdered like there is some stuff there but still she straight up in cold blood like uh her carriage is going down the road they like ambush the carriage straight up murders this girl so she can take her place so that happens very early and I was like wow okay like we're going there because so many books you know talk about ever like especially with the characters like you know she's supposed to be this like badass kind of character and then you know nothing ever happens but you know no she does some shit there's also some other stuff that happens later on in the book that again I was like wow the author is like willing to go there and I love that appreciate that about an author there is a romance in this obviously and that is where this book lost me a little bit and I normally love the romance element of books but for some reason I wasn't invest as invested in this romance as like I thought I would be uh, and it also is very kind of like insta lovey um but yeah in the end like I enjoyed this enough I ended up giving this 3.5 stars um, I then read from the library to volume two um, by John Lehman and Rob Guillory. This is the second book in the series, follows Tony Chu, who is a Chiba bath, which means when he eats, consumes, 
anything he can like see its history he uses this to help solve crimes basically by chowing down on murdered people he can like figure out some stuff that's been going on um, I really enjoyed this second volume it was super fun like it's like crazy but like really really fun I ended up giving the second volume 3.75 stars I then also read volume two of The Promised Neverland by Kayu Shire and Pasuka Demizu. This is a manga series that follows a um, orphanage where basically there is an, an orphanage being raised by like a, you know, a woman runs this orphanage and uh, the little kids there, a couple of them who are like the older ones discover that maybe something untoward is going on. We're following that story. Um, I enjoyed this book, not as much as the first one, but I did still enjoy it. There are some good twists. I really look forward to seeing where we're going um, in future volumes. And I ended up giving that one 3.5 stars. I then listened on audio to The House in the Cerulean Sea by TJ Klune. If you guys saw my June wrap up, then you already know that this was <sighs> broke my five star drought and that I gave this book five stars. So this is a male male um, like kind of urban fantasy um, romance. Um, so we're basically it's kind of set in like our world, but then there are um also like magical creatures um and we're following a man who works for the department of magical youth something um and he basically goes is sent quite often to um assess orphanages and check that they're orphanages that are being um housing magical youth and seeing how they're run and reporting on them and all of that and he basically gets sent to this really uh remote orphanage that's being run by this man with all of these like magical children um and it's about him you know, discovering it. It's basically a romance between him and the man who runs the orphanage. Mm, a plus. The children characters in this, like, hats off to TJ Klune because children, I love children. I'm not someone who dislikes children. I genuinely really like children. Um, but children characters in books can often be just like a ruiner of books, especially in romances. But all of the children characters were just so, like, they made this book for me. I adored all of them. One of them is the literal Antichrist. Lucy loved him to pieces. Um, I really enjoyed the romance. Like, this book is not serving you any, like, great twists and turns. There's nothing in this book that you don't see coming. It goes exactly where you expect it to go. But there is such a enjoyment and comfort in that. Um, and the way that it, oh, it was just, this book was so heartwarming. There is a little bit of like commentary in there on like kind of um, like segregation and prejudice because obviously there's a lot of prejudice against um, people who have magical, like or magical creatures in some way. Um, and the fact that they're raised separate and that they, magical people don't have any say in their own way of life um and the rules that are made about them all of that there's a lot of commentary kind of sprinkled in there on that but it was just this was narrated by the way by daniel henning a plus i absolutely adore this like i said gave it five stars i then read avenged by amy tintera this is the second book in the trilogy i don't know this one was okay i just wasn't as engaged in this one as i was in the first one but i still enjoyed it like i don't have that much to say about this can't say that much without spoiling it i'm still going to continue on i only own the first two but i am going to get the third one out from the library so i can finish the trilogy this one was just okay i end up giving this one three stars um i then listened on audio to the lost village by camilla sten this is narrated on audio by angela Dor and is actually a translated work it's translated from the swedish by alexandra fleming this is what follows a woman who is kind of leading a film crew um, who are going to this lost village, which is this like old mining town where one day the entire, everyone in the town just went missing all at the same time, just completely went missing. And it is her grandmother's sister, like her grandmother's family. So her grandmother had moved away, but her sister and her parents still lived in this town and they went missing. And so we're following a different perspective. So we're following... The woman who's leading the film crew and we're also following um uh the mother so the grandmother's mother um who is in the mining town is that it we're just following those two perspectives i think so um oh sorry i should say so that everybody in the town went missing the only things that were found were a baby and there was a dead body like a woman that had been stoned to death like in the main square and then like a baby was found um and so like i said we're following that story 
I like that sounds like such an interesting premise. I was so disappointed in this. Um, I see I gave it 2.75, honestly generous because the ending of like, so there was somewhat decent atmosphere. Like the atmosphere was kind of okay, but it lacked tension for me. And the, also this whole film crew aspect made zero sense. Like they literally are doing nothing and seem like they have nothing planned out. Like it was very like amateur hour and I know nothing about being a film crew and I was still just like, this seems very amateur. And <sighs> the ending is so beyond ridiculous that you're just like, this makes absolute zero sense. This would never happen. And like even more, like I know a lot of times in like thriller horror books, you have to like, you know, suspend um, your beliefs a little, like, you know, the basis of reality a little bit, but this was just like taking it to the next level. Um, like I said, didn't love, oh, and the characters, characters way underdeveloped, just like issues all around. Like I said, 2.75, probably generous. I then also listened on audio to, Winifred is real trying me that she wants to knock this camera over. Okay, well, if you're coming up, because people can't see you, now I look like a weirdo. Uh, please don't show your butthole. Um, I then listened on audio to Charlie and the Great Glass Elevator by Roald Dahl. Mm, don't, so unladylike. Um, Charlie and the Great Glass Elevator by Roald Dahl. Honey, okay, we just, there's no room for you up here. I'm sorry. Um, this is the sequel to Charlie and the Chocolate Factory. It is narrated by Douglas Hodge. I couldn't remember if I had read this sequel previously and so I picked it up listened to it on audio it's only a couple of hours I don't believe that I did read this sequel as a kid because this sequel is ridiculous like the premise of this is I, don't, I guess I don't want to tell you what the premise exactly is because it's kind of spoilers for Charlie on the Chocolate Factory which I'm sure everybody knows the storyline of but just in case um it's just everything that's happening in this book is just like it's so unnecessary as a sequel and it's just honestly ridiculous I gave this 2.5 stars I was literally listening to the whole thing and I know it's a children's book but I was listening to the whole thing going what in the heck is actually happening in this story right now and so yeah I gave it two and a half stars I then read um another couple of neck alley arcs the first one was the girls are also nice here by Laurie Elizabeth Flynn this follows a woman who is getting invitations to her college reunion um and is basically alluded to that something happened to her like they did something while they're at college somebody knows some secret um and you know will she go back for the reunion blah 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 and then so we get that time period of her about the reunion but then we also get the time period of her back in college in her like freshman year at college and what happened I enjoyed this I don't but this kind of falls into like a niche interest of mine which is really really toxic female friendships um so it's basically about um the main character like befriends this girl who is very bad for her like a bad girl like um and is very like influenced by her she makes the decision that she wants to befriend it's not like her kind of getting sucked in like she's like spots out this girl right near the beginning of school it's like she's like the cool bad girl I want to be friends with her and like get sucked into her world and she does um and it's about what happened back then the characters not likable know that going in um and personally the ending again I have this opinion about a lot of books in this video I think some people might have issues with the ending I personally liked it um and I ended up reading this one 3.75 stars thought it was pretty solid um, and then the next neck alley arc that I read was The Dinner Guest by B.P. Walter. This one um, is about basically right at the beginning, there's some people at a dinner party um, and one of the guests is dead, has been like murdered. Um, and someone immediately takes the blame for it. But we know up front that maybe like that person didn't do it. And like, what's going on? Who did it? Why is this person taking the blame? So on and so forth. Um, I will say this has a gay main character. So the guy who's been murdered is like one part of like a gay couple. Um, so I liked that because we don't get a lot of um, LGBT representation a lot of times in thriller. So I liked that. Um, the kind of whodunit, incredibly obvious. I don't know. If, it was one of those situations where you're like, is this supposed to be as obvious as what it is? Because to me, it was incredibly obvious. Um, again, parts of this ending, though, I just didn't feel like there were like character moments that were happening that I didn't feel like we had led up to enough. Um, and then like characters made decisions. And I was just like, this doesn't like fall in with like what we know, like about these characters. This was just okay for me. I ended up giving it three stars. I then uh, read uh, Babysitter's Haunted House 
by, I said haunted house, is it haunted house or is it haunted mansion? I think it's haunted house by Anne M. Martin. So this is the first in the Babysitter's Club Super Mysteries. These are the ones that I have been waiting for. My library has all four of the Super Mysteries. These are the books that I loved the most as a kid. I read every Babysitter's Club book as a kid, but these are the ones that were like it for me. And this one um, in particular, there are two of the Super Mysteries that I remember more clearly than the others, but this one I remember so clearly. Like, and it was just what I remembered and just what I wanted. I enjoyed it so much. The nostalgia like levels for me were incredibly high. I absolutely adored it. There is one like kind of squeaky thing where it like this happens a couple of times in Babysitter's Club books where like there is a potential romance between um, Claudia in this one and a boy. He's in like I think a freshman in college. Claudia is 13 and like it's not like as if anything like happens but it's just like even the implication that and he's supposed to not be able to realize how old she is like he thinks that she's um at least in high school I think and I'm just like oh well, I think he thinks that she's 16 which even then I'm like freshman in college with a 16 year old mm. but like there's no way that, a, that he can't tell that she's way too young for him like 13 I don't care how mature you look as a 13 year old it was just weird and gross but apart from that absolutely loved it gave this four stars really adored uh, reading like one of my faves from my childhood. I then listened on audio to Harrow Lake by Kat Ellis. This is narrated by Robert G. Slade, Becky Stewart and Jessica Henwick. Um, so this is about a girl whose father is kind of a famous horror movie director. Um, at the beginning of the book, he has been stabbed. And so she's basically sent to stay with her grandmother who lives in the small town where one of his like very early movies was set and filmed and where her parents met because her mother was from this small town um hence why her grandmother lives there and so she's sent to stay with the grandmother this small town is like kind of a 20s inspired like town um I think it's 20s anyway um I was pumped about this book for a long time I did not like this I had so there were so many unanswered questions at the end of this book um I do think the atmosphere was the best part of the book. This like strange town and like weird happenings. You're never really sure. It's all very like um, weird, creepy going on. All of that A plus. But then the actual like events that were happening and like the descriptions of like what was happening, I thought like I just thought was really, really poorly done. Um, and there's like so much that's like left open to your interpretation, but like not in a good way, in my opinion. Um, in the end, I rated this 2.75 out of five stars. <coughs> I then read, <coughs> excuse me, If I Die Before I Wake by Emily Kosh. This was my June TBR teacup pick. So this one is a thriller. It's about a guy who is in a coma. He was in a, uh, rock climbing accident has been in a coma for two years um he's but he is everyone thinks that he's like um you know not responsive that he can't hear anything but he is very aware of what's going on he can hear he's aware he can't see unless if his eyes are left open when he's in the coma he can kind of like make out like shapes and stuff but he can't like properly see but he can hear everything and is aware of like what's going on around him um, and then it's about him discovering that maybe this rock climbing accident wasn't an accident and trying to figure out what's going on. I hated this, quite frankly. Um, so you're reading this from the perspective of the guy in the coma. And I've read books told from perspectives of people in comas before. This one was poorly done, in my opinion, because it's not really like flashing back. Um, even you're just literally following him in the coma. It is incredibly dull. Um, and he doesn't even really discover that there's some like secret to be figured out until like a good chunk of the way into the book. For the beginning part, it's just him kind of reminiscing on what's happened and how hard it is for him to be in a coma and like what's kind of going on with the people in his lives, who he's left behind, who are still like the people who are coming to visit him, family members, he's got a girlfriend, all of that. It was just like incredibly, incredibly dull. Um, the wrap up to like the mystery was incredibly obvious, like you know, there was no like great shocks, twists and turns. And then I, so I'm going to put a spoiler warning up on the screen because I'm going to spoil um, the end of this book, not to do with the mystery, but the end of the book, um, because I feel like I can't talk about the issues that I have with this book without spoiling it. So if you're really, really interested in reading this, um, skip until the spoiler warning goes off. I'll also try to put a timestamp on the screen. So this guy is in a coma, but he's not in the type of coma where you can just like switch off his life support and he would uh, die. He's like, um, 
basically the only way for the families to like let him move on to die is for them to um remove his feeding tube um and let him starve to death which they, they would have to go to court to do to get like an order to do that or basically that one he gets um because people in coma quite often come down with uh like pneumonia and things like that to just not treat it and let him die from that it's not a matter of just like flicking off a machine um and he is aware of like what's going on um and at the beginning of the novel he wants to die he's just like you know i'm like i'm ready like for this to end i don't want to be in this anymore like i'm ready to die he's constantly trying to like die um which already like kind of can have issues with but then he basically throughout the course of the novel decides that he wants to live he doesn't want to die he's trying to solve this mystery so he at least wants to stay alive so that he can like solve the mystery and like potentially protect like his girlfriend um and doesn't want to die and then still at the end of the book he doesn't want to die and his family choose to kill him well to kill him that's a harsh term but just choose to like let him die he ends up getting the pneumonia they decide not to treat it and to let him die and he dies at the end of this book and I have such a problem with an author representing someone who is in a coma and is aware um and then being let die because I feel like it's such harmful representation to, to people and I haven't been in this personal situation but I still had a problem with it but if you have a family member who is in a situation like this and you're having to make the really really difficult decision to possibly let that person die and then there's books like this where you're thinking what if they're alive and they don't want to die they're begging you not to kill them and then you kill them I just thought it was really 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 harmful and I really 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 hated it I gave this two stars on reflection that might even be generous but I had real real problems with this um and like I said two stars I then read The Uninvited by Sophie Jordan this is the first book in a duology um it is about a our everyday world but where the government have tested that there is a particular gene they can test for which is um called I mean it's got like a homicide tendencies gene or something it's got like a proper name but it's referred to by as everyone but as the kill gene um and our main character is a very like well-to-do young lady in high school she's popular she's you know really well off she is a like musical prodigy doing really well for herself when she tests positive for the kill gene and it changes her whole life because people who are tested positive for the kill gene are not allowed to like emote like every like it's one of those things where like every state's different but they're not allowed to like go to school with regular kids and um, any infraction that's considered even slightly violent um, they are branded with like a mark sorry I'm like playing with shit on the table they are branded with a mark um, and you know it affects their whole lives and all of that I enjoyed this um, because I the way it shows kind of the sliding scale of how the government may respond if this like became a real thing and I for the most part thought it was like um pretty like believable um there is a romance in this it's why it's very heavy on the romance and the romance has issues I will say I was like into the romance even though I recognize that it has problems it's very much kind of that alpha male um wanting to protect the female and you know all of that which you know has its issues but it was like they had good chemistry um I enjoyed it for the most part I look forward to seeing how it wraps up in the sequel um and in the end I gave that 3.5 stars and then the final book that I read during this three-week period was The Color Purple by Alice Walker this is a modern classic um uh by a black author about black characters um we're mainly following a character named Seely who has had a very very hard life she um was raped repeatedly by her father and has had two children by him that have been like taken away from her um and she has a very close relationship with her sister and her father basically ends up like selling her off in a way to a, a man who wants a wife basically to just come in and like raise his children um and then she basically ends up getting separated from her sister because her husband wanted the sister because the sister's the like pretty beautiful one and then he's making like untoward advances to the sister so the sister kind of leaves for her own protection separating the main character Seely from her sister um and the husband that she has is very abusive it's a very like hard life for her she's just supposed to be there to like cook clean take care of his kids um and he beats her um and all of that it basically just follows Seely's life um it does have uh some lgbt stuff in there there is a female female relationship between Celia and another character which in the movie i will say this is a lot better in the book because i have seen the movie of this um 
it's not put on the page. I'm not sorry, put on the page, put on the screen and in a very clear way in the movie that it is like a romantic relationship between these two characters. Whereas in the book, it's like, that's what this is. Um, so in terms of that, um, the um, book was better. But I personally, I think I enjoyed the movie a little bit more than this. Um, I actually didn't struggle as much with this. So this was written in like kind of dialect. It's written the way the characters would like speak and pronounce words, which I sometimes can struggle with, but I didn't mind it so much in this. The, this is about the characters and the relationships and all of that was really, really strong. The part for this where it kind of lo lost me a little bit is about halfway through um, we get a perspective, not what well, kind of a perspective through like some letters of um, Nettie, which is Celie's sister. And those parts got kind of long and like they were a lot less interesting to me. And that part of the story kind of lost me a little bit. Um, but in the end, I ended up rating that 3.75 stars. Oh my God, I apologize so much. This video is so long. I basically lost the entire light. The lighting is now completely shit and I still have to film two more videos. So, oh my God. <laughs> But I would love to chat with you guys in the comments down below if you've read any of these books, if you've got any thoughts on them, or if you want to chat to me about what you guys have been reading recently. We are slowly catching up. We have made it up to the beginning of July. So stay tuned for more recent reads videos coming next week. Um, but yeah, I would love to chat with you guys in the comments down below. Please like this video if you liked it. Please subscribe if you want to see more from my channel. That is all I have for this video today. Bye, guys.